the next bit of the presentation is then talking about the role of um, farm planning and how we can build biodiversity into farm planning. And, um, and th this, this, this bit of the presentation is very much based around what Beef and Lamb are doing um, with, with their farm plan and, and, and that, that is a good, a good tool to help with, with this. So, you know, farm plans, I mean, you, you all do planning at one level or another on your farm, whether it's an annual business plan or whatever. And, and farm plans are a great way to respond to those regulatory pressures and, of course, to market as well. And there are different types of farm plans, but the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Farm Environment Module, which has sections on soil, water, carbon, biodiversity, um, is, is the, the best thing that's out there. And, um, and it's also, it dovetails beautifully into the Farm Assurance Program Plus standard, the new standard that they brought out. Um, and if you've got a, a, a farm plan with beef and lamb, then you'll be meeting the requirements of the, um, the uh, FAP Plus standard. And, and I think um, we are going to see um, that FAP Plus standard um, becoming the norm in, in New Zealand farming as, as we try to you know, break or maintain our access to our markets overseas. Um, beef and lamb, um, and I, I actually wrote the biodiversity module in their farm plan um, with them. Um, and they are at the moment, we just, well, they are, we are, I am with them, we, we're working up that as a workshop that can then be rolled out across New Zealand um, to help you folk as farmers to actually write farm plans for your farm. So this is kind of like, you know, on-farm biodiversity 101, that'll be on-farm biodiversity 201, and that, that will be coming in the next year and year and so, and the idea is to run it across with facilitators across all of, all of rural New Zealand to help people actually prepare their biodiversity plans so that they can meet the standard. And I also helped write the FAT Plus standard for biodiversity, and as I said, if you've got a biodiversity plan, um, you'll meet that standard and, and it will enable you to, to be verified uh, through that. And there is a lot of interest. I know Silverfern Farms are, are getting a number of their farmers up to the FAT Plus um, level and I'm sure the others will all be doing the same thing in the next um, year or two. So um, they're all available online. Um, the Farm Plan Environment Module is available on the Beef and Lamb site and this is available on, I can't remember what the website is now, but whether that one is, um, you can get them all online. There's a lot of detail in there, a lot of information and there are a lot of templates and supporting information to help you do that. The point I wanted to make at the start here is that really bi biodiversity is no different to anything else you do on your farm. The way you think about it, the way you plan for it, the way you manage it, the way you monitor it, is exactly the same as all the other things you do. So this is my sort of schematic for this. You're at the middle here, your, your business, your family that's running the farming operation. Um, the blue line means you carry out the operations, whether it's renewing your pastures, looking after your soils, your, your livestock, your pests, health and safety, freshwater, biodiversity, they're all the same. The things, the operations, the things you do on the farm. You monitor that, you monitor your livestock performance, you monitor your pastures, you monitor your health and safety, you monitor your freshwater, you monitor your biodiversity. That feeds back to the, to the management. And then you have a plan that sits above that that um, you would review your monitoring, it would influence your longer term plan, sets up your annual work plan and back into there. So, so I guess my point is biodiversity is just like everything else you do on your farm. It's not something that should sit over there on the shelf and, and never be looked at again. It should be part of that annual cycle of, of, of planning and monitoring and, and thinking about your farm business. And like everything else, biodiversity is influenced by regulation, just like fresh water is, like animal welfare is, um, like health and safety is, and it's influenced by the markets as well, in just the same way as all those other things are. So, so you know, biodiversity is just one more component. And I think the way Beef and Lamb have written the, um, the environment um, module, the environment part of, of, um, of the farm plan, um, is, is a pretty straightforward way to incorporate biodiversity into your thinking. And there's sort of six steps. Understand what you have, think about your long-term goals, identify the things that might be opportunities to, to achieve your long-term goals for biodiversity, what might be the risks or challenges or constraints, develop an operational plan, um, develop and implement some monitoring, and then review the plan regularly. Um, and it's fairly straightforward and there's really good templates. I'll just go through it quickly, but there's good templates in, in the material on the Beef and Lamb website. This is probably the most difficult thing to do, um, and, and really this is the biggest challenge for you as a farmer, which is because you're not ecologists, you know, you're not botanists, you're not bird people, you're not reptile people, so how do you know what you have? And it, it, is, it is the biggest challenge in my mind. 
Um, so we, we've developed some templates in there. Um, the first thing is to simply have a, a map of your farm and just know on your farm where, where the bush patches might be, where the wetlands might be, um, where, where the tussock grassland areas are, where the rock outcrops are. So you've got some idea where these things are on the farm. And then we, there, there, there's guidance and assistance in there to help you then for each of those to go through and, and, and actually describe what might be in it and um, you know, what, what are the dominant species. Um, is it in good condition or is it in bad condition in terms of is it grazed out? Is it full of weeds? Are there deer through it? Um, has the wetland been invaded by willows or, or whatever is going on? And the idea of doing that exercise for each of these patches on your property is so you can then start making some more informed decisions about where you might put effort in terms of management, what might be a priority for management, because you can't manage everything. Management comes at a cost, you're busy, you've got a farming business to run, uh, and biodiversity costs money. So what, what might be your first priority? What might you do? And I think it's really important, and I've, I've said this before and I'll say it again, that you think about your farm in the wider context. I think it's really important that you understand what's around you, what's on your neighbours, and what's even further afield, because Many of the values on your farm, the, 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 the kateroo, the pigeon I saw flying around before, it won't just live on this farm, it'll be on the next farm, it'll be on the conservation land over the back somewhere, it probably goes right across to the Catlins forest, you know. So it's being influenced by a much larger landscape. But then some of the threats are as well, pigs or deer for example, I mean they'll be covering tens of kilometres. Um, so just what you do here um, is going to be also influenced what's in that wider landscape. And so I had a quick look, I mean th this website here is really, really helpful, so this is um, called uh, Walking Access New Zealand or Haringa uh, Nuku, um, and they've got maps and there are other things like this that show public access areas um, around New Zealand, so we are just, if I got this right, I think we are just sitting down in this gully about here somewhere. Um, and I can see straight away there's a bit of conservation land on the other side of the ridge there, and there's another bit of conservation land there. And when I looked at this map on the aerial photograph, this is mainly tussock grassland and shrubland, but this had native forest in it. So the kereru that are here wouldn't think twice about flying backwards and forwards between there. So understanding a bit about the wider landscape is really useful. These maps are really good too because they show all of the public easements, uh, public road, paper roads, uh, Queen's Chain, all those sorts of things. So if you're not sure what's on your farm, they're really worth having a good look at. So then coming down to your farm, so this is just a hypothetical farm. I've just drawn it on an aerial photograph. It's on the west coast, the aerial photograph, but it's got three bush remnants, a wetland, and a couple of riparian or three riparian strips on the property. Um, so the, the simplest level is just to do a map like this and just say, what have I got, um, what's on the property, um, and, and what is it? Forest, 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 wetland, and riparian. Um, then the next step is to then, and, and there are templates for this, to then go through and, and you know, you could fill these into whatever sort of level of detail you want to. This is actually a different farm, this is a little kofi grove here. Um, this is on a farm up the Kadrona, and I've drawn a little map of where it is, the, there's a fence up here, I've wandered through it, where I took photographs from, and I've just filled in, it's a tiny remnant, it's less than a hectare, it's forest, but it's secondary regenerating. The canopy is what we call diffuse, and you can go and fill this all in. I made a couple comments about what plants are there, uh, what birds I saw, and then there's more information on the next couple of pages as well. They're just designed to help you get some feeling for what you might have, what might be the values. And the most important part of this is there's a, a summary score sheet uh, on this page here where it talks about um, you know, what are the values of the patch. This one was degraded, small, isolated, had few species, and no rare species. So it's probably very low value. You wouldn't necessarily make it a priority. Um, what sort of management is required if you want to look after it? It needs fencing, um, uh, but it doesn't need any weed control and there's no evidence of pigs or goats in it. Uh, what's its value to the farming operation? It was irrelevant. It was a tiny patch. It was of no real importance. So that can help influence your prioritisation. So there, that, that's all there in, 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 the, um, in the guidelines to help you um, get an idea of what's there. But it's really hard. How do you know what species you have? How do you know what's in your patch? And it's not very easy to do that. Um, sometimes there are council records, and you had a report from um, someone who had been here some years ago and actually done a little description of that bit of bush, which is really helpful. There might be SNA descriptions in some areas. Um, some parts of New Zealand have had what are called protected natural areas program surveys, and they often have quite a lot of information, but they haven't covered all of New Zealand. Um, they're totally on 
on private land, they didn't focus on conservation land. And there might be other reports and publications. Um, it's just, you know, sometimes you can find out, sometimes there isn't anything. There are various online resources. I'll show you some examples in a minute. But often the most knowledgeable people are, are people like the QE2 or, or these land care and, and, and um, catchment um, group um, people. They, they often can be real, really helpful. There are often local experts, people in the wider area who, who know about, about what's here. The nurseries, <laughs> Booker Hour here, um, you know, people like that. And so you guys often are collecting seed, you know what's around. So there are lots of people you can go to, neighbours, catchment groups, regional council staff can be useful as well. Depends on who's got knowledge in an area. Um, and I've often, you know, people often say, well, we don't really know anybody and, and, and maybe as a catchment group you do need to employ an ecologist. You need to get somebody to come in and work with four or five of the farms in an area, share the costs and, and, and you know, build up some knowledge. It, it is a challenge. It, it is the biggest challenge for managing biodiversity on your farm is, is knowing what you have. But there are a range of things out there that can help. And, and it's, it's really good. You could, get, you could get in people to come and do, you know, Botany 101 or, or Birds 101 or whatever and, and help you learn what some of the species are. And the common things are relatively easy to learn and to know what's out there. It is a bit harder knowing what the rare things are. There's a resource called iNaturalist which is a record of, of all the, um, a, a GIS type database of all the records of plant, animal and fungi uh, in, in the world actually. And, and it's often incredibly how many places people have been to and observed things. Someone would have driven along this road here and might have seen a kateroo, the pigeon fly by, and they would have necessarily logged it on there. So you might go to your farm, you might be surprised how many dots you find um, on your farm. So there's information like that. There's various websites and, and these, um, you'll provide these slides um, um, in the next wee while. There are different websites that can provide you with information. Landcare Research will provide free plant ID for farmers if you've got plants you don't know what they are. There are various phone apps. There's a whole range of things out there that, that can help you. But it is a challenge and it is a big challenge. Once you've got an idea of what you've got, the next thing then is to think about, okay, what's my long-term goal for my farm? Where would I like to see biodiversity on my farm in, say, 20 or 30 years' time? So thinking well out there, you know, what would I like to see? And it will vary from farm to farm, and it'll depend on what your situation is. And that's just something I made up there, but a, a dawn chorus of bellbirds and tui greets us each morning. Our stream is abundant native fish. There'll be a range of things like that that you'll have. And in developing that, it's then important to think about, okay, what are the things that might constrain our ability to achieve that vision? Or what are the opportunities of our property that might help us achieve that vision? And we put a template in the guidelines around that as well. Um, and so, and, and I like to think of those opportunities and constraints as occurring on your farm or occurring beyond your farm. So the opportunity, this is for that hypothetical one before, there are several patches of Kaikatea forest and a wetland. Um, we're doing a trapping program, we have some new plantings, and we're really committed. That's, that's an opportunity. The constraint on the farm is we've still got a lot of fencing to do, and that comes at cost, and costs are going up, so that, that's a constraint. Um, and we're starting to see some dieback in our remnant trees. Um, perhaps the cattle are damaging the root systems and they're starting to die. Um, what about opportunities beyond the farm? Well, we're part of a catchment group, um, and I think catchment groups are really important. There is some regional council funding, and we've got extensive native forest adjacent to our farm, which means there's a good source for birds to come in. But what are the constraints beyond the farm? Well, climates are changing, we're getting more floods, which are damaging our, 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 our riparian areas. It's getting more and more expensive to meet all the regulatory requirements. That bit of bush next door is great for the birds, but we're also getting possums and deer out of there, so it's also a constraint. So it's thinking about, it's just a risk analysis. It's thinking about what are the risks, but also what are the opportunities. And then from there, to me, you know, that vision is somewhere where you might want to be in 20 years' time. Um, you can't get there you know, this year or next year. So then what, what are the steps you might do? And this is where you start to prioritise and think about well, what are the things that we can afford to do today that will help us towards moving towards that, achieving that vision. And so this is really a, a prioritised action plan. And I see these as the stepping stones towards meeting that vision. And it's important to take this sort of approach because, you know, biodiversity, like everything, comes at a, com a, a, comes at a cost, a cost of time, and a, and a cost of buying plants and doing things. But also, because often to do this stuff, um, you need to stage it. So if you want to um, fence a bush gully off, that stream that's through that bush gully might be critical for water. So you need to get reticulated water into the paddock, which you have to do before you fence the stock out. So, so having that staged approach 
is a really good way of, of working your, your way through what you want to achieve. And then for each goal that you identify for this action plan, individual management actions, where you're going to do it, when's it going to occur, and what's the cost associated with doing it. So what I've been doing with farmers I work with is developing a spreadsheet like this. So this goal is for Banks Peninsula Farmers, is out of a, a real management plan. Um, they had funding um, through the, uh, that old One Billion Trees program to do a whole lot of planting. So this particular stream that we're, we're fencing off the riparian zone and also some of the paddock as well where the stream does big loops for fencing the whole loop out and doing quite extensive planting. Uh, there are three stages to the project. One stage is just retiring an area where there's a power line corridor. We're not going to plant that obviously because the power lines go through there. Um, so that's the first action. The second action is to order plants for stage two and three. Fence stage two and three, and then plant stage two and three, and then monitor the planting. So we spread those over time, and we put a budget in beside each of them as well. Um, and I really believe if you don't sit down with biodiversity and actually do this staged action plan type planning, you're never going to do anything. Because if you don't sit down and think about what can I afford to do it, when can I do it, you know, what's the order of doing it, it's not going to happen. And, um, you know, and that, that then, when you know what the costs are going to be, you know it's going to, you know, you can afford to plant 1,000 plants a year or 3,000 plants a year. You can then think, OK, I'll do some this year, some next year. Then I'm going to have to leave it two years because I've got to do some fencing first and, and so on and so on. And in terms of the types of management people are doing on farms for biodiversity, there's a wide range of things. You know, fencing, obviously, um, controlling plants and animal pests, um, various types of restoration, whether it's planting, um, whether it's natural regeneration, um, you're talking before about um, putting um, um, sediment traps in, your hydrological manipulations for wetlands can be really important. Building native plants into shelter belts, homestead gardens, you know, can be really useful. Um, using native biodiversity for an economic return and using exotic plants, recognising the role of exotic plants as, as value for native biodiversity as well. So there's a, there are a wide range of things. So. Um, fencing off a remnant here, you know, killing pests, riparian planting here. This is climbing asparagus, a horrible weed, trying to control those things. That, they're all the different types of action. And then the final thing is, is to then monitor what you're doing. I'll talk about that in the last section. And then review your management plan regularly. Build it into your annual farm review cycle as you review what you're doing each year. Adapt what you're doing based on what you have learnt. It's a, it's a very simple rule, but um, don't, you know, just re keep reviewing. Have you been successful? If not, why not? Or why didn't you do it? Or have you have been successful and adjust? Always be prepared to learn and adjust. And I put this slide in to really say, well, that all probably sounds really, really overwhelming. Um, you know, it's yet another thing to fit into your busy lives. Um, so make the point again, beef and lamb are rolling out the biodiversity module next year, and it'll be done through catchment groups like this. So talk to beef and lamb and, 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 and that, and they, they will be bringing that out. You can do it yourself. The templates are there on the beef and lamb website. Or you might you know, want to employ someone to help with you, uh, help you, help you through it, and there are people who are offering that service. The biggest challenge is knowing what you have and how it fits into the wider landscape. It, it's a real challenge. Um, and I think working in the catchment groups is a really good way to do that, um, to try and learn that information. And as I said, the New Zealand Farm Assurance Programme Plus standard will require you to have a biodiversity plan and biodiversity monitoring. So again, quite overwhelming. Um, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming. Um, I'm going to have a sip of water. Any questions?